Can you just turn to your neighbor and greet them? Shalom. And what does shalom actually mean? Peace. I heard some of you say that. Right? Most of us know that shalom means peace. Right? That's right. But it actually, it's also much more than that. It actually refers to wholeness, completeness, and wellness as well. And so if you have wholeness, completeness, and wellness, then you have peace or shalom. All right, and over, over time, right, this word shalom in a Jewish culture becomes a greeting. Right? So when you say shalom to another person, just as you all just did, right, you're actually simply wishing the person well. Right? And today, I wish all of you shalom. Right? And I now want to take this time to also you know, pray for you all. Shall we just uh, close our eyes and I pray for you? Father God, this morning we want to ask that your shalom peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord, you will come here and embrace each and every one of us today and you touch our hearts and minds. Right? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, let me begin by sharing a piece of good news. You know, my wife just gave birth to my second son, John, uh, one month ago. <laughs> Thank you. Right, and in fact, uh, he's getting baptized later, right, as you probably heard, so I cannot preach too long, otherwise I may delay his baptism. Right, as, as some of you may know, my first son is called uh, Judah, and he just turned 19 months, so he's not the one getting baptized, he's already baptized, right? It's, this is, um, the one who's getting baptized is my second son. Right, so my first son, Judah, he loves to eat. Right, my uh, mother-in-law calls me his uh, nutritionist because I'm the one who plans his meals since he started solids and I try to give him something different every day uh, to, you know, to expose him to a variety uh, of food and also to make sure that he has the right nutrition from uh, the different food groups. And among all the food that I give him, right, his favourite is this star-shaped puffs. So I usually give him one serving after his meal as a treat. Right, and initially, you know, he'll quite, quite, you know, finish his meal, and then after that, I'll give him the star puffs, and he'll be very happy. Right, but after a while, right, uh, he becomes smarter. Right, halfway through his meal, he will start to ask for the puffs. Well, so what do I do? You know, I have to tell him, no, la, you, you can't do, have that. You'll have that later. Right, and obviously, he won't buy it, right? And sometimes, he'll end up crying, throwing tantrums, and even throwing his food on the floor. And he looks like this when he's doing that. Yeah, I put it a bit smaller so, you know, uh, it's not so obvious because he'll be attending the service later, so I don't want him to recognize himself there. <laughs> so how many of you parents have experienced something like this before? O only Pastor Chris, uh, so oh, also one more at the back, yeah. So I'm, uh, yeah, we need to reflect on, on ourselves, right? We are the minority, it seems. <laughs> right, at the start, you know, I will try to reassure him and promise him that I'll give him the pass, you know, at the end of his meal. Right, but that only worked for a while. You know, so in the end, I tried to introduce a reward and punishment system with him. Right, each time he finishes uh, his, a certain amount of food, right, he gets a puff. And each time he throws his food on the floor, you know, I take away a puff. And so far, right, it's been working, right, thank God. And I know that's because uh, he's still a toddler, right? So imagine when he becomes a teenager or a young adult, right, do you think I would still expect him to function only based on rewards and punishment? Right, of course not, right? I will want him to be able to understand my heart and hope that you know, our relationship will be based on that. Right, that's because a reward and punishment system is never meant to be a final solution. Right, there's a limit to what a reward and punishment system can do. Right, it can help to temporarily alter behavior, but it's not going to bring about real change. You know, last week, Pastor Andrew talked about Jesus and the law, and that while the law was getting us to do the outward behavior, Ultimately, it is Jesus who can change our hearts inside. Right? And we need Jesus to inscribe the law in our hearts. You know, we have been at this covenant series for a number of weeks. And I'm not sure if you have wondered why would God want to make a covenant with us? Because if he wanted to provide rain and shine for the earth, right, he could just do so without making a covenant. Right? If he wanted to bless Abraham and make his descendants his people, right, he would also do so without making a covenant. And even the laws can be given with just the blessings and the curses without necessarily entering into a covenant. So why would God choose to do that? Right, I would like to suggest to ask two possible reasons. Right? The first right, is to reassure us. Right, in the covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David, God didn't actually have to bind himself, right? but he chose to. And I believe it is out of a father's heart to reassure his children. You know, when Judah first cried for his past midway through his meal, right? I told him, you know, I promise I'll give it to you at the end of your meal. I promise you. 
Right? I was going to do it anyway, even if I don't promise. Right? But I gave him a promise nonetheless, right? and it's actually to remind him and to reassure him. And the second reason is to realign us. Right? The whole system of rewards and punishments in the Mosaic Covenant was meant to change us. And it did change the outward behavior of the people to some extent, but it did not fully realign their hearts. So when Jesus came to bring the new covenant, it was meant to be a game changer, right? Because the way we are to realign ourselves is now given new light. We should not just be motivated by rewards and punishments, which is the law, but by love. Right? And the new covenant showed us with this example of Jesus, right? And also the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And today, we're going to talk about, you know, how living this out is going to look like. If we try to live out all the essence you know, of what God had wanted us to do in the law, it would ultimately look like a lifestyle of love. And if we do it collectively as His people, we become the kingdom of God. Right, shall we look at a text today? Let's read it together, right? Today's reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 21. You can look at uh, the screen. Uh, let us begin, right? One, two, three. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Right, the title of today's sermon is The Kingdom of God. And you might have heard this mentioned a number of times, right, in the past few weeks. Um, sometimes I feel that, oh yeah, you know, it's a bit of a spoiler. My, my sermon is, was already, you know, preached halfway somewhere in, in between. Right, but that's because it's difficult not to mention it when it is so central to God's story. Right, God's purpose right from the beginning is to establish His kingdom. And today we are going to explore these two questions, right? The first is what is the kingdom of God? And second, how can we live and bring the kingdom of God? Well, let me just begin right at creation in the Garden of Eden because I want to show you that God's idea of His kingdom, it is the main plan for humanity all along. It is not a remedy plan. It's not that, oh, something wrong happened and now I need to change my plan. Right? That was the original plan. Right? This beginning in Genesis 1 is very important to us because it shows us a picture of what God intends for us to be. You know, the Bible described everything as good, and after God created Adam and Eve, it was very good. Right, in what way was it very good? You know, I would like to suggest to us that it is a picture of shalom, right, or peace in the sense of being complete, whole, and well. Right, it is complete, not lacking in anything, because everything that Adam and Eve wanted, what they needed, they are all provided for there. And it was whole, right, because the fullness and abundance of life is available to them physically, and also relationally, where they have each other and they can commune with God perfectly. And because of that, they are in perfect wellness and they were meant to live forever that way. Right, to live forever. Do you all want that? A bit silent, not so sure. Some people want to say yes, but you don't dare to nod your head, sir. It sounds like a trick question. <laughs> right, sometimes when we think about Christianity and salvation, we equate that with eternal life. Right, but actually, eternal life is not necessarily a good thing. Right, imagine right, a husband and wife who quarrel every day. Yeah? Right, eternal life means that you're going to quarrel forever. <laughs> and when you look at it that way, perhaps immortality doesn't always look all that blissful. You know, what's the point of living forever and forever if there is no completeness, wholeness, and wellness? Well, that's actually more like hell, isn't it? And I think that's why, you know, when story writers, human story writers across time, they, when they try to reimagine uh, immortality on human terms, but right, it's often a, a sad and depressing portrayal, right? one of striving but never reaching, pining but never having. That's because immortality on human terms can never be attractive. You know, the true blessing is not in living forever, but being in shalom. Right, the first time the Bible mentions the word shalom is in Genesis 15, 15. It says, you shall go to your fathers in peace, or shalom, and you will be buried at a good old age. And Shalom here is not talking about life eternal, but ironically, it's talking about death. 
And the context here was God speaking to Abram, and he told him that when you die, you'll be in shalom. When you are in shalom, even when you die, it is not a bad thing. Right? It's not even a neutral thing. It is completeness, wholeness, and wellness. And in a sense, this is a foreshadow of the eternal life that John talks about in the New Testament. Right? In Psalm 133, the psalmist yet gives us a glimpse of what eternity might look like. Right? It says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Right? It is like the precious oil on the head running down a beard on a beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. And when I read this verse, right, when I'm uh, talk, talking about the beard of Aaron, it reminds me of John Ham's uh, beard. <laughs> and John Ham's at a control over there. Actually, he's, he and his family are now back with us. So we give them a hand to welcome them back. Right, we are still in, in the midst of the verse. Hush. <laughs> it is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Also, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing. Where is there? There is in a good and pleasant place where brothers dwell in unity. Right, so the blessing of life forevermore is about dwelling in unity, in peace with one another. So eternal life is only blissful when there is shalom in our relationships. Right, God's original intention for us since Adam is shalom. And when we walk into his plan, we enter into his peace. Right, in Genesis 1.28, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all the living things. Right, so out of the peace that man has with God and with each other, he is to also extend that and bring that to all the earth. And though it was not explicitly stated here, the language used here, right, if you've noticed, it actually already hints at the idea of a kingdom under God's rule through his people. Right, but this shalom was broken when they sinned, and there is no more shalom between man and God. So let me ask you this, right? What is the first sin that man committed after fall? After fall, the first sin. Anyone? I heard somebody said hey, Abel and Cain, something. Right, so that's murder, right? The first sin was murder. Where when there is no more peace with God, when the shalom is broken with God, naturally there can be no shalom between men. So when God brought about the different covenants, his objective is first to reassure his people that he's still going to carry out their original plan, and second, to realign us back to his peace. And this was meant to be carried out in full force when Jesus came to teach about the kingdom of God. Right at the start of the gospel in Matthew chapter 3, we see John the Baptist preaching, repent, right, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Right, if you are a Jew living in those times, it would have definitely caught your attention because ever since God made the covenant with David, the people have been waiting for the kingdom to come. Right, so it's no surprise that in verse 5 it says that Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. Everybody is going to see him. And in the next verse, it tells us that even the Pharisees and Sadducees were going to see John's baptism. Right, why were they there? Right, in one of my previous workplaces, there are sometimes these lunchtime talks. You know, personally, I don't like lunchtime talks because lunchtime, I want to eat. Nah. I don't want to listen to someone talk. Right, but there was this strange culture back then right, where almost everyone will go. And not only do they go, but they will go and they will try to ask a smart question. Right, I later found that actually many of them also don't want to miss lunch. But apparently showing up at these talks Right, it's like an important thing to the bosses. Right, so asking good questions is also a good way to profile themselves in a the company. So why were the Pharisees and Sadducees there? Right, in short, it's to, it's to see and be seen. Right, the fact that John called them brood of vipers later on tells us that they actually weren't there for the right reasons. And theologian D.A. Carson also suggests that they were there to show how ready they are for the Messiah, even though they have not truly repented where the Jews know the importance of the Messiah and the kingdom, right? because that is a promise that they are still waiting on God. And the Pharisees and Sadducees certainly didn't want to be left out of the party if the kingdom is coming. Right? So they went just to show that they were interested in the kingdom. But as we know, where after they heard and saw John and later Jesus, they began to distance themselves. You know, why is that the case? You know, that's because they had formed the conclusion that what Jesus was talking about cannot be true. Right, the kingdom they thought they had understood had deferred so much of what Jesus talked about, and they decided to reject it. And what is this kingdom that they understood? Right, I'm sure you have been a Christian long enough, you would have heard or read somewhere right, that it is about a political kingdom. 
But how did they get this idea? Right, in first, second Ch- Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16, you can see it on the screen, that is basically the Davidic covenant, where the Lord spoke to David through the prophet Nathan. And in their memory, right, God had promised David a kingdom to come after him. And in their minds, David's kingdom was a political and military kingdom. Right, we know David as King David. And so they thought the promised kingdom would be similar as well. Right, in the first sermon in the series, Reverend Chris Hall said that the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place, under God's rule. Right, that is true. But if you really want to drill it down to the lowest denominator, right, the key defining mark is simply just God's rule. Right, that's our first point today. The kingdom of God is God's rule. Right, God's rule must come in first in order for the people of Israel to be a model for the kingdom of God. But many of these Jews actually got the order wrong. They thought it was all about the place, it's about the land that God is going to give them, and it's about the people under, uh, that, that's going to come together. And when the place and the people come together, they will usher in God's rule. And that's why they focus so much about the physical stuff, the laws, right? How to keep the form to the letter, the political kingdom that they can see. All these things, they're actually peripheral. Right? God's kingdom is not about a place, right? It is about His rule. Right, in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 to 21, the Pharisees question Jesus himself, right, when is the kingdom coming? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Right, two things here that Jesus said about the kingdom. First, it is invisible. No, it cannot be observed. And second, it is in the midst of you. Right, and Jesus had to start off by saying that the kingdom of God is Invisible because he needs to first dispel this wrong notion, get this wrong mindset out of the way. That in order to understand the kingdom of God, he needs them to discard their old ways of thinking. Right when I was in national service uh, many years ago, and I had to go for, to Brunei for training for about two weeks, right, and during that time, right, everyone, when we hear we have to go to Brunei, we are very demoralized uh, because we know how harsh and tough the conditions were there. Right, and I remember on my very first night there at the camp, right before we started our mission, I thought, okay, I better relax first uh, because the next two weeks is going to be crazy. Right, so I went to the canteen, I ordered a, a bottle of Coca-Cola from the stall, and then I walked back to join my friends at the, you know, at the table. Uh, and when I unscrewed the bottle cap, it's supposedly new, when I unscrewed the bottle cap, I was surprised to see that the whole rim of the bottle cap right, was uh, filled with ants. Right, so don't ask me how it happened. I also don't know how it got inside there. So, of course, I went back to the store, right? And I, I showed the uncle. I said, hey, you know, it's quite unacceptable. You know, brand new bottle. You know, how come inside got ants? Can you give me a new one? So he was very kind. So he said, okay, yeah. And he took out a rag, and then he wiped the ends off the rim of the bottle opening. And he passed it back to me. New. <laughs> you know, that is not the kind of new that Jesus wanted the people to have. It's not that kind of new understanding. That is not the kind of new that Jesus is talking about at all. It's not about wiping off some old parts or just to make a few tweaks here and there. It is something totally different. Right? When the people were expecting God's kingdom to come as a political leader who would lead the people to the old glory days of David and Solomon, Jesus told them, no, 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 it's not like that at all. Jesus is asking them to think about it in an entirely new way, right? like new wineskins. Right? In Greek, there are two words used to describe new. Right, the first is this word called neos, and the second is this word called kainos. Right, neos is, is new in the sense of fresh, that means something that has been out for not too long, like a fresh grad right, or fresh milk. Right, and the second, kainos, means something totally different, something novel, a totally new kind. And you see, when these words are used together, it is when Jesus mentioned pouring new wine, which is the word neos, new wine into new wineskins, kainos. So in other words, God is doing a fresh thing using a completely new and novel wineskin. Something completely new and novel, that's kainos. In our text today, it says that in Christ, you are a new creation. That's the same word, kainos. That in Christ, we are not just refreshed, but we are made completely new. So when Jesus told the Pharisees that the kingdom cannot be observed and it's not here or there, it was meant to be a new perspective. It was meant to be a kind of shock to stop them in their tracks. And then he went on to tell them where the kingdom can actually be found. Right? It is in your midst. Actually, this sounds a bit like a riddle, right? It is invisible, yet in your midst. Where can it be? What is actually in our midst, you know, between me and you and everyone else here? Anyone? Want to guess? What can it be? This is oxygen, hydrogen, air. Now, I would like to suggest to us that it's relationship. 
Because the kingdom of God is relational in nature. If you think about it, right, all of the Mosaic laws, the Ten Commandments, they were all laws pertaining to our relationships, our relationship with God and our relationships with one another. Right relationships are the defining feature of the kingdom of God. And when we have that, we have perfect peace or shalom. Right, in Matthew 18, 20, Jesus says, when two or three are gathered in my, may, in my name, I'm, in, I'm there among you. I'm in your midst. Why, why is it two or three? Why not just one? Because God is everywhere. God can be with you. Because if it's just one, there is no midst. Right, there's only a midst when there's two or more because it is about relationship. Right, God's kingdom is relational and relationship must take place in a group of people. So if the kingdom of God is God's rule and God's rule is relational, right, how will this kingdom look like? How can we live and bring the kingdom? Right, you may say, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute, right? Like, didn't we say that it is invisible? Right, how can we you know, see it? How can we say what it looks like? Because the kingdom of God is invisible because God's rule is something relational. You can't see relationships visibly per se, but you can see the manifestations of it, right? You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of wind. You can't see gravity, but you can feel the effects of gravity because if you feel fat, you know, it's gravity. Uh, and so while the kingdom is in some sense invisible, it can be lived, felt, and made known when his people reflect his rule in their relationships. Right, Paul puts it this way in Romans 14, verse 17. It says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Right? It's not about these physical things. It's not about the laws, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Right? Can everyone say righteousness, peace, and joy? Many times when we think about righteousness, where we think about it as our personal virtues, right? how right we are, right? did we do right? Actually, righteousness is not a personal virtue per se, as it is a relational value. Right, whether we are righteous or not, it's about how we relate to God and to other men. Right, so the kingdom of God is about righteousness, and when we relate righteously with God and men, we have peace and consequently joy. Right, in fact, verse 19, right, in the verse that you read earlier, later on emphasizes it again. It says, So then let's pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Right, one way in which we can live and bring the kingdom is to pursue peace with one another. Because when we have peace, God's peace with us, we build one another up, and that is meant to be the way kingdom is to be lived, in shalom. You know, my wife and I, we used to have a couple friends who, who, who are quite close to us. Um, but over time, because of perhaps some misunderstanding or unmet expectations, they had distanced themselves from us. And it's quite an uncomfortable thing because you know that you know, someone isn't too happy with you. And we have tried our ways to initiate a meetup and to ask about their lives, but we know, you know from their responses that they, they didn't want to engage with us anymore. And it's definitely you know, difficult to come to terms with that because uh, once we were quite close, right? And now you know, they actually don't want to talk to us. So my wife and I, we often prayed about this to God. We, we, we asked God, you know, what does pursuing peace with them look like? You know, I remember a conversation I had with her. Um, I, I, I remember telling her, you know, I feel that we have already done all we could. You know, we have texted them already. We tried to arrange to meet them. Uh, but if they don't want to engage, I think it's not our fault anymore. Right? That's not our fault anymore. You see, I realize that sometimes we have this unconscious way of thinking about righteousness as whether is it something right or wrong that you do. Right? It's very natural. What did we do? Is it, is it something right that we do? But righteousness is about relationship, right? And if righteousness is about relationship, then what is the right way that God would want us to relate with one another? Not so much about whether that thing you're doing is right or wrong, but how does that affect your relationship? So my wife then told me that she feels convicted that she wants to you know, ask one of them you know, if there is something that they are unhappy with us about. Or, and in addition, she said, maybe we should be very proactive in this, right? We, we don't just ask them, well, you want to meet, but we really, really propose uh, a few dates and timings right, and ask them, right, uh, you know, can you want to consider meeting on these slots? So to me, that's actually taking very active steps to make peace. That's pursuing peace with one another. But as of now, this story is still a work in progress, right? Our friends initially said they will try to meet, but in the end, they said they were not ready to meet us. But a slight improvement is that when we bump into them, they could still master a fairly neutral, you know, high, you know, like that. And I think that's not bad. But has God's rule come into our friendship yet? You know, I would say maybe not, not at this moment. But we are submitting ourselves to Him 
and to his rule, and we are praying, right, that he will come into our relationship one day. You know, at the same time, I also want to say that this peace that God is talking about is not the same as what we commonly hear in the world. Right, it's not a world peace that we hear about, or, you know, that, that kind of refrain, love is love, that kind of unqualified peace that the world so often raves about. No, shalom peace is not about having no tension or conflict with anything. Because if you want to be at peace with God, you cannot be at peace with darkness. Right, it's not an unqualified kind of peace. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 10, chapter 34, chapter 10, verses 34 to 39, that do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Right? Not that kind of unqualified peace. I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a, friend's en- a, a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Right, so what is Jesus talking about in this whole chunk there? Because on one end, uh, he talks about peace in so many places, right? And here in Matthew 10, he says, he didn't come to bring peace. You know, well, if we, if we read very closely, it's, it's not all that complicated, right? He's saying that he's not coming to bring that kind of unqualified peace that shies away from all tension and conflict. Sometimes, peace will bring about a certain kind of division. Right, the shalom peace that he wants to bring about is wholeness, completeness, and wellness, and that begins only when we get our order of priority right. right. Our lordship of Jesus must come first before any relationship we have, whether it's parents, in-laws, enemies, or even our children. So when we have the lordship first, then we can have shalom. Right? If not, everything else falls apart. You know, so how can we pursue peace with one another? Right? Shalom peace begins with a prince of peace. Right, you cannot have shalom peace by starting to do good out of your own goodwill. It must begin with Jesus. Right? In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, it records the angels saying this when Jesus was born. Uh, they, 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 they sing out, right? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Right? The very reason why Jesus came was for our peace. And when we receive Jesus, the Bible tells us that we become a new creation. Right, I know today we have read quite a number of verses, but now we are coming you know, to our text for today. Right, if anyone is in Christ, right, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I hope that as you read this again today, you can feel the full weight of what Jesus is saying. Right, he's coming to do a new thing, kainos. He's coming to make us entirely new, a new creation. Right, earlier on, we said that the new understanding is that the kingdom of God is about primarily God's rule, and God's rule must be in our relationships. Right here, it explains more clearly how that is to be lived out. Right, verse 18 tells us that when we become a new creation, the first thing we need to know is that Christ reconciled us to himself. And then the next thing is that he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Right, so the next practical thing we can do is to live and bring the kingdom of God is to be reconciled with God and man. Right, the basis of reconciliation here is stated in verse 19. That is to not count their trespasses against them. In other words, it is forgiveness. Right, the theme of forgiveness in God's eyes cannot be understated. Right, it is the very thing that allows us to make peace with God again. You know, when Jeremiah prophesied about the new covenant, he said that the Lord will write his law on our hearts, right? That is last week's sermon. Right, and there's a second part too. He says, and he will also forgive our iniquities and remember our sins no more. Right, so if we are entrusted, right, as verse 19 says, with the message of reconciliation, we also need to forgive. You know, there was one day I happened to switch on my TV in the morning. And you know nowadays people don't watch TV anymore, right? Especially in the daytime. So do you know what they actually show on Channel 8 uh, in the morning? Have you switched that on before? It's not really the news. The news only for a short while. Right? Actually, it's about... Local celebrities selling things, you know, all sorts of things, you know, from massage chairs to slimming pills to vitamins, right? It's a bit like tele shopping in the 80s. Right? For the younger people, tele shopping is like the grandfather of e commerce, right? If you don't know, you can still go and Google what it means. Huh? When I first saw it, I was quite curious, right? Because uh, then I was looking at this local celebrity, right? It's quite, uh, usually you see them in shows, right? You see this local celebrity trying you know, his best to uh, describe the product, try to sell something. And he was like describing this chicken essence, right? Talking about how good and nutritious it is. And then he started pouring out, you know, pouring it out onto a bowl of uh, soft boiled eggs, like those yakun eggs. And then he said, oh, you can even eat it with the eggs. Now you don't need soya sauce. You can, you know, just put it inside there and eat like that. 
I'm not going to tell you what, what, what brand it is. Lah. But actually, only got one brand. Lah. Then, uh, then his, uh, his co-host asked him, uh, hey, you want to demonstrate, demonstrate, try and eat this? Then he was like, uh, no, lah, no. Then after that, he was like, trying to save himself, right? So he's like, uh, because uh, just, just now I already had my breakfast. And I was looking at this whole thing, I was like, this is quite amusing. Uh, because that is the most unconvincing sales pitch I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, when a brand ambassador is not willing to use a product, then it tells people that the product isn't worth buying. You know, likewise, if we are to be ambassadors of Christ, right, as verse 20 says, we need to model out forgiveness and reconciliation. Right? Otherwise, we will be like that celebrity salesperson I saw on TV. Right? You can see how central forgiveness is when you look at our Lord's Prayer. Right? We, we know this by heart. Right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right? It says here, forgive us as we have also forgiven those who sin against us in verse 12. And immediately after the end of the Lord's Prayer, in verse 14 and verse 15, he adds on to elaborate again, right? If you, have forgive, if you forgive others for their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you. That's quite interesting. Because of all the things that were said in the Lord's Prayer, why did Jesus choose to elaborate on forgiveness? Why not elaborate on daily bread? Right? Since it's something that you take every day. Why not elaborate on facing temptations? Because that's such a huge part of our walk as well. Right, I think that's because forgiveness has a special place. It is fundamentally such an important thing for the believers, and I will go as far as to say, it is a necessary ingredient for love. Right? God's love for us begins with forgiveness. And uh, for married couples, and also for those, you know, going for PMC, uh, I know the counsellors always say this, right? Um, the three words that you need to learn to say, right? It's not, I love you, although that's important. It's also, I forgive you. And if we are able to live a lifestyle of forgiveness, Right, then the kingdom of God, right, or God's rule, will be in our relationships. I think it's inevitable that we will offend one another so long as we interact with one another. Right, I'm sure we all know this by now. Right? It is not a new message, right, but we need new forgiveness all the time. Right, especially whenever we offend or is offended by someone. We need it fresh. Right? We can't use the old forgiveness from last time. It doesn't work. Right, so my encouragement to myself and also to all of us, is to be truly humble before the Lord and remember His example of forgiveness to us and use that to motivate ourselves to forgive every time. Because I think sometimes, you know, when we uh, interact with our friends, we know that maybe we can tell, right, through the interaction that there is some unforgiveness there, right? But when you maybe probe a bit further and say, hey, do you want to forgive so-and-so? Sometimes, quite often we hear, hey, I've already forgiven already. Oh, I'm okay, I've already forgiven. But in their interactions, you can see that it's a little bit awkward, it's different. Right? So let's not be like that. And I know it's difficult because personally, I will share a, a story for myself as well. You know, personally, you know, I, when, I, when I grew up, uh, I, I had a hard time with my mother. Right? So we, we didn't have a great relationship. And after I became a Christian, you know, I, I have to forgive her, I have to you know, do this, let God do this work in my heart. But actually, even though I don't feel any bitterness towards her anymore, when I look at her, I feel neutral, right? I wouldn't say I feel love, but in the past, when I look at her, I actually feel quite negative, like there's a lot of unpleasantness. Now, when I look at her, I'm neutral, right? But when I talk to her, sometimes uh, the onlooker will feel that, like, eh, it's a little bit strange, like it's very cordial, or sometimes my face is just very blank when I speak to her. You know, and then my, 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 my wife would have to tell me, say, hey, actually just now, you know, you look like, why are you so black face? They say, I, I never black face, I'm just normal, you know? <laughs> so actually, if I were to be very, very honest with myself, maybe although there is the bulk of the forgiveness that was already done, but there's still some remnant there that needs to be done over and over again. And sometimes, you know, for us, it's a little bit like that. And I think the starting point is to be humble, right? To recognize that uh, it can come back again. Right? Uh, we need to take active steps. The, it's a lifestyle of forgiveness. If it's so central to, uh, to, 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 to God's message of forgiveness, then let's not take it lightly too. Right, to sum up, you know, we asked two questions at the start of the sermon. Right? The first is to, you know, what is the kingdom of God? When the second is, how can we live and bring the kingdom? Right, the kingdom of God is not about a place. Right? It is, it's not even about going to heaven. You know, John the Baptist says it is near. Right, it is near. If we accept God's rule in our relationships, then the kingdom of God becomes here instead of just near. And how do we live that out? You no, know, we live and bring the kingdom by pursuing peace with others 
If that's taking proactive steps to build and restore our relationships, we live and bring the kingdom by being reconciled with God and men. And we do that by practicing forgiveness daily. And as we do that, you know, I believe we enter into God's shalom, His perfect peace, right? His wholeness, His completeness and wellness that He had designed for us to be from the start. You know, today as we come to a close, I also want to talk to two groups of people, right? The first group, right, is those of you who have never known Jesus, right? This is the first time that you probably heard about this thing called the kingdom of God, about God's peace that could come in such a way, right? If that's you today, you know, I would like to pray for you. Can we just have every head bow, right, every eyes closed? Is there anyone who would like to receive Jesus for the very first time. You have not done this before, but you want this peace in your heart. Can you just raise your hand? Anyone here? Anyone here? And the second group of people here I want to speak to today is those who find it, you know, hard to make peace and forgive, right? Uh, this message, you know, heard every now and then, you know, you preach in church, you know the right thing to do, but you just can't do it. Right, if that's you today, can you just lift up your hands so I can see where you are and I'll pray for you later. Okay, I see that hand over there. Anyone else? Thank you. Let us not rush this moment, right? Let's take this time to spend this time with God. Because as we have said, no shalom begins with the Shah Shalom, right? The Prince of Peace. Let's take this time to ask God, you know, to, to reveal to us, is there a, a person or a name that comes to mind you know, that we need to forgive or make peace with? Right, forgiveness is your own heart posture. Making peace is taking the extra step forward right, to take active steps. Right, is there anyone like that in your life? Right, so if, if the Lord is impressing upon your heart, I want to give you time to respond. Anyone who, 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 who want to respond to God, you raise your hand and I will pray for all of you. Can I invite you to stand? I want to take this time to just look to God. As we sing this song, those of you who have raised up your hands earlier, you can come forward for prayer. Um, our pastors will be in front. Uh, they, will, they will pray for you. Uh, you can share with them you know, the needs that you have and we'd like to pray together with you because we are all in this together. Where right? shall we worship the Lord? We let, us, let us just all look to Him. You know, the lyric says, you know, God, I look to you. you know, I won't be overwhelmed. I won't be overwhelmed by you know, the, the things, that, the steps that I have to take, the discomfort that I may face you know, to, to forgive. I won't be overwhelmed. But give me this vision right, to see things. Have that kingdom mentality, the kingdom mindset like you do. And you are where my help comes from and give me the wisdom to know just what to do. Let's worship the Lord. vision, oh Lord.
we love you. We love you, Lord. I would like to ask the musicians to keep playing. No, I, I don't. I sense that you know the Lord perhaps is not fully done with us. I, I believe today, you know, God is speaking to some of us here, and there are different situations in our midst, right? That perhaps we need God's peace in, right? It could be our family. It could be somebody in our family who is who was once close to God, but now is far away. Right? And being reconciliators, right? Being ambassadors of Christ, we are also to bring that reconciliation, that message to them. And if that's you as well, I would like to invite you to come forward. I think this message is for you as well. And also for those of you who have been hurt by people, right? especially church people, maybe leaders or your friends, right? and you'll find that that's hindering the peace that you have in your heart. Right, as we worship one more time, right, come forward. Yes. Let's sing that from the top one more time, right? God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I Love you, Lord. Forever, all my days, I will love you. Forever, all days, we will love you. But our love is imperfect. We want to ask God that you teach us to love the way that you do. And whatever that you have deposited in our hearts this morning, Lord, I pray, God, that you'll make our spirit yield to your spirit, that we will walk with you, Lord. I also want to pray for all of you. Let me just pray this ironic blessing over all of you that you have that peace of God, that shalom peace. Right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you peace. All right, service is over. Right, we'll see you next week.